The 19th century had a problem. Okay, to be fair, the 19th century had chronic warfare, multiple large famines, serial international aggression in various styles, and its fair share of epidemics. But it also saw more goods become available to more people than ever before in human history, thanks to the power of steam and steel to make machines that made goods, and to the power of oil and coal to transport them to every corner of the world. Material wealth, though still unequally distributed, spread farther and wider than had seemed possible. But as the Industrial Revolution attracted more and more people from the countryside to urban life, cities remained antiquated. And that was the problem. A city in the middle of the 1800s looked like a somewhat more populous version of a city from the 1500s, and not all that different from a city of the 500s, or for that matter the 500s BC, with more soot and it accommodated residents the same way, in buildings of brick or wood or masonry no more than five or six stories tall. With such little vertical space, the only way to accommodate the people flocking to the factories was to jam them into whatever urban crevices seemed to be less overflowing than the others. From 1750 to 1900, the share of Western Europe's population living in cities went from 13 to 40 percent. In the United States, it went from 4 percent to nearly 40 percent. Bursting at the seams, cities spread into the countryside, but even growing sprawl failed to relieve the ubiquitous overcrowding. The only solution would have been to go vertical, but the materials of the time couldn't stand it, literally. Buildings were constructed out of brick or dressed stone, laid one block at a time, by masons or bricklayers with mortar in between. These walls had to support the entire weight of a structure and everything in it, with the result that building high meant building thick. The result looked a lot like a medieval fortress, with walls up to 30 feet thick, pierced only by tiny slits for light. The inside of the top floor had about enough space for a broom closet. The only way to have any interior room at all was to keep the building low and the walls thin, or transfer the load to flying buttresses, but those almost doubled a building's footprint, and cities didn't have that kind of space. So buildings stayed short and cities spread out. In addition to being squat, buildings were costly. Stone had to be quarried, cut, and dressed, or bricks made and fired. Limestone had to be quarried, crushed, and burned in a kiln at 900 degrees Celsius for several days to produce lime, which would be mixed with water and sand to make mortar to hold the bricks together. Then both blocks and lime had to be hauled to the site at that date by wagon. The horses or oxen pulling the wagons, the teamsters driving them, and the masons or bricklayers who troweled the mortar onto each individual block before placing it in the wall to be, all had to be hired. And they were expensive. Bricklayers made more than double, and masons triple, the wages of an ordinary laborer or low-skilled factory worker of the same time. That was on top of the price of land, which in cities was soaring far higher than a building could. Space at height was getting to be a problem even before the 19th century had officially gotten underway. Nor was it limited to cities. In 1755, the timber and stone lighthouse marking the Eddystone Reef, a collection of tiny coral outcrops off the south coast of Cornwall, got a little too lit up and, in fact, burned to the ground. The reef may have been tiny, but it was too dangerous to leave unmarked, so the government cast about for a contractor willing to try to build a functioning 70-foot-high lighthouse on top of the largest usable rock, which was less than 40 feet across at low water. In case building a tower that high on a base that small wasn't bad enough, the lighthouse also had to withstand a constant barrage of saltwater waves crashing into its foundations. Fortunately for the mariners of Cornwall, 
One applicant for the contract was a then 31-year-old named John Smeaton. Born in 1724, Smeaton seems to have been determined to pursue engineering from the start. A biographer relates that his parents were one day alarmed to find their five-year-old son perched on the roof of the barn, testing some modifications to the toy windmill he had constructed after watching a group of millwrights at work. His father decided that the best thing to do with this engineering talent was send him to law school. But after two years, the young Smeaton put his legal training to use by writing his father a strongly worded memorandum of resignation and took up making scientific instruments and mechanical engineering. By the time the lighthouse contract came up, he was anxious to try civil engineering as well and submitted a successful application to build it. Smeaton made a careful study of materials while designing the lighthouse. Timber had just demonstrated its unsuitability for the task. Brick was ruled out early on as lacking both the strength and the resistance to seawater. That left stone, which was durable enough, but what to hold the stone blocks together with? The conventional lime mortar then in use was clearly not the solution. This consisted of lime, water, and sand or aggregate, and it hardened from a paste to a cement by drying out and soaking up carbon dioxide from the air to convert the powdered lime into crystalline calcium carbonate. In technical terms, this made it what we today call a non-hydraulic cement, strong enough for general purposes, but incapable of setting underwater obviously a disadvantage for building on a reef that partially submerged in anything more than a flat calm. Holding the stones together with iron or copper bands was considered, but discarded on the grounds of prohibitive cost. Whether because of his legal studies or because the neoclassical fashion of the time made some acquaintance with Roman history unavoidable, Smeaton had at least heard of the fabulously tough underwater concretes of ancient Rome. These were called pozzolans and had been the mainstay of Roman architecture during the empire's height, including everything from ordinary harbor walls to the 43-meter-wide dome of the Pantheon, still the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome today. There is no evidence that Smeaton ever traveled to Italy and saw any of it himself, but he knew that making a cement that could harden underwater was technically possible and determined to make some himself. He may have read about this in the works of the Roman engineer Marcus Vitruvius, whose ten books on architecture give detailed descriptions of how to make a cement that would harden underwater and, as Cato the Elder commented, only grew tougher with the passage of time. After spending the winter of 1756 on a series of experiments with mortars made from different ingredients, Smeaton figured it out. The key to making a pozzolan was the purity of the limestone used to make the lime and in this case, the less pure, the better. Using limestone with a high clay content meant that the lime would have silica and aluminum in it, as well as calcium. When mixed with water and sand, the impure lime would harden not by absorbing carbon dioxide from the air, but by a series of chemical reactions among the calcium, aluminum, and silica. The cement gained its toughness, its resistance to water, and its steady hardening over time from the growth of calcium aluminate and silicate crystals, not from carbonation like an ordinary lime mortar. It would be more than a century before all this was understood. All Smeaton knew was that lime made from limestone containing natural clay could make a hydraulic cement, one capable of rapid hardening underwater he had solved the problem of how to build his lighthouse. The result proved resilient enough to suffer no damage while standing at sea during a storm that destroyed most of the neighboring city, and was only decommissioned some 120 years later due to the erosion of the rock it was standing on. Smeaton's lighthouse and the hydraulic cement had held up just fine. A Frenchman, Louis Vicat, took Smeaton's experiments further with a detailed study of a whole range of limestones and clays in the early 1800s. 
critically rather than relying on limestones with a naturally high clay content, Vicat decided that the best option was mixing pure limestone or chalk with clay, grinding both together to ensure an intimate mixture. When mixed with water and aggregate or sand, it produced a quick-setting hydraulic cement, usable underwater or above it. His process resembled one developed in Britain around the same time and patented in 1824 by Joseph Aspden. Since the preferred building stone of the time was a limestone termed Portland stone, Aspden decided to market his new product under the name Portland Cement. Although it cost double what the standard lime cements of the time did, Portland cement proved popular. But it was much weaker than the Portland cement of today, until the 1840s, when Aspden's son William accidentally made the key advance. A batch of cement had been left too long and too hot in one of the kilns, and had seemingly burned. It was hurriedly mixed up and used anyway, and the result proved much stronger and more durable than usual. Repeated experiments showed this was no anomaly, and the process of clinkering, burning the lime and clay until they melted and reacted to form hard, strong calcium silicates, became standard in the Aspen family cement business. The powdered cement was then made by grinding up the clinker. Rather than seek a patent for it, the family embarked on a campaign of misdirection to protect their secret. Whenever lime and clay were being poured into the kilns for burning, Aspden had his workers carry in large amounts of copper sulfate and pretend to add it to the mix, too, to give any spies the impression that that was the reason for the excellent performance of the family cement. Unfortunately, his taste for deception embraced his business practices as well as his technology, and he died bankrupt after a succession of legal troubles in 1864. Over the next few decades, Portland cement continued to improve. By the 1880s, its compressive strength was nearly triple Joseph Aspden's original recipe, and its uses stretched well beyond mortar for wave-battered lighthouses. It still made mortars holding blocks together, but it could do more than that. When Portland cement was mixed with an aggregate of crushed rock and poured into molds, the result was concrete. Soon, the foundations and walls of buildings were being made in concrete instead of stone blocks. Concrete foundations were cheaper and faster, especially for large bases like the one under the Statue of Liberty. Modern steel making was spreading around the world, too, at this time, and during the late 1870s, it occurred to someone that a material that combined the high tensile strength of steel bars with the high compressive strength of concrete would have the best properties of both. The optimum combination was a network or mesh of steel bars placed throughout the mold into which liquid concrete was then poured, hardening into a material that could support almost any type of building against any type of stress. Thus was reinforced concrete born. This steel fist in the concrete glove appears to have been invented at more or less the same time by engineers in France, Britain, Germany, and America. At the time, all these countries were in a frenzy of industrialization, accompanied by urbanization. How to pack more people into cities was an urgent problem, and reinforced concrete was the solution. Starting in the 1880s, buildings were no longer squat masses of block. Instead, architects began to design edifices that were little more than steel frames resting on reinforced concrete foundations, with thin curtains of glass and concrete hanging from the steel. These were cheaper than masonry, and could be built taller with more functional space, especially at the top. The first of these, Chicago's Home Insurance Building, rose to ten stories, all of them functional. Two more floors were added in 1891, setting a record for the time. But it would not be a record for long. Cities began to grow upward as well as outward, and so the face of the world would never be the same again, all because of lime. 
Today, concrete is so synonymous with building and development that economists use its production and use as an index of industrialization and track a country's economic growth by its consumption of cement and concrete. Today, of the materials from the Industrial Revolution, concrete has become the most monumental.